Hi guys, welcome back to a new retro adventure. You see, this week in the poll, instead of putting up the usual selection of role-playing games and source books, I put up a series of adventures for different role-playing games. Because my idea was, I'd like to cover these, but not to go through them in complete detail, which would spoil it for anybody who's going to play it, but more to give you ideas on what I thought of it, what I thought particularly good points were, any advice I had or changes I made when I was running it or reading through it. And at the end of the first poll, you've decided to throw me a bit of a spanner because there was a tie when I looked last night. Both this, Beyond the Mountains of Madness for Call of Cthulhu, and this, In Search of the Unknown for Dungeons and Dragons, were tied on 30%. Now, Beyond the Mountains of Madness has now pulled ahead, so I'm going to do that in this video. But I'll be back on Friday to do In Search of the Unknown because I didn't know which one to prepare, so I prepared both, so I might as well shoot two videos. Now, it's matter that the fact that Beyond the Mountains of Madness is 400 pages, and In Search of the Unknown is 30 pages, so I had no anxiety attacks at all in not knowing which one I was going to prepare, which is why I did both. Anyway, I'll be back at the end of the video with some poll-related stuff and some other channel-related stuff, but if you'd like to help out with the channel, we've got Patreon in the description down below. So you can see these videos a week early if you sign up, and generally help the channel out. It'd be very much appreciated. Anyway, let's have a look at Beyond the Mountains of Madness. So, this is Beyond the Mountains of Madness by Chaosium, and it came out in 1999. Now, this is a sequel to H.P. Lovecraft's at the Mountains of Madness. His longest short story, I believe it is. I could be mistaken. And it hooks heavily into that story because that story is written as a warning to a later expedition to Antarctica, the Starkweather Moor expedition. And this book details, or allows the players to take part, in the Starkweather Moor expedition to Antarctica. So this is what they were trying to prevent by writing at the Mountains of Madness. Now, this is a 1930s setting book, which isn't one of the standard settings for Call of Cthulhu. The main rule book is set in the 1920s, so only slightly different. And then you've got other settings like um, the Cthulhu Victorian setting, um, You've got Cthulhu now, which is in modern days. We've got 1890s, we've got modern days. But this is just slightly different. But it doesn't make a huge amount of difference because we're only 10 years different from the main rule book. It's not like there were any massive inventions. The mobile phone hadn't come out or anything stupid like that. Life was still pretty much the same. Now, this is an absolutely massive tome. This is 400 pages thick. It's thicker than the main rule book of Call of Cthulhu itself. And it is a epic Antarctic campaign and source book. It details so much of life in an Antarctic expedition, the different types of food stuff, travel, everything to do with that. It details the adventure itself and then a massive portion of the book, as many Call of Cthulhu adventures are, has a huge amount of handouts um, it's so so good for that now let's have a look at the back cover before we start going through it beyond the mountains of madness little by little they rose grimly into the western sky allowing us to witness various bare bleak and blackened summits in the reddish antarctic light against the provocative background of iridescent ice dust clouds in the whole spectacle there was a persistent pervasive hint of stupendous secrecy and potential revelation I could not help feeling that there were evil things. Mountains of Banis, whose farther slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. H.P. Lovecraft. For great enjoyment of this epic campaign, read At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft, found in the companion book The Antarchos Cycle by Chaosium. Players will enjoy the handouts, expedition patch, decals, and more in the Miskatonic University Antarctic Expedition Pack. Well, I don't have either of those, but I do have At the Mountains of Madness in a separate uh, book of Lovecraft short stories. Now, 
The book itself is set up into sections. It is all one, although it's a campaign, it's not separate adventures. It's one storyline completely across it, but it is broken down into sections. So you wouldn't have to run it all in one many long weeks of play. You could break it down. You could have, there's a large section based before you leave the mainland. Then there's the voyage to Antarctica. Then there's your adventures in the foothills. Then there's the Mountains of Madness themselves. And then there's evacuation from Antarctica and the journey home. So you can break it down into many separate parts. Or you can run it as one massive adventure, as I did. I ran this through uh, about five, six years ago. Is one... I, I'm trying to think how long it lasted. Something like 16 weeks of play or something. Uh, now inside we've got a photograph of Howard Phillips himself. The artwork is very nice. Um, very much evocative of the bleakness of Antarctic. And that's one of the really strong parts of this adventure. That while there is all the Cthulhu Mythos stuff, there's all the stuff hooked into the... Uh, at the Mountains of Madness, it is also very much about humans at the limit of their technology at one of the farthest frontiers of the planet. I really enjoyed running it through that, where it was just so different. You know, people were having to live a very routine life, the players having to go through surviving as well as surviving the adventure. Um, lots of many good names involved in this. We go through, there's lots of acknowledgements. A massive and very useful table of contents because there is a fair amount of flicking back and forwards because they find information early on when they're on the mainland which they will want to refer back to. But as I said, this is a Cthulhu adventure. It has a massive amount of handouts so the players can handle a lot of that. Uh, the foreword, which details much of the adventure and how to go through it. I'm not going to go through absolutely every section because I don't want to spoil all the sub parts of it. We've got a list of all the characters, which is very, very useful. There are a lot of people on this expedition to Antarctica, and keeping track of them I did find kind of useful from this. Um, while only a few will become common to your players. They will know the leaders of the expedition and perhaps a few other characters they interact with. Most of them will just be faces. But being able to keep that consistent was very, very useful to me. We've got what the world knows about the Miskatonic, Uni Miskatonic University expedition to Antarctica. So what happened in At the Mountains of Madness, but what the public knows. They know that the expedition failed. They obviously don't know the Cthulhu Mythos aspects which were discovered. So, they start off by discovering that there's this expedition going, it feeds you a bunch of background information, and then they kind of get hired into it. The two main people behind the expedition are James Starkweather, who is an adventurer, a Victorian adventurer type character, a gentleman, and William Moore, who's the scientist. So he's going up there for the information, he's going up there for the excitement. Um, when you actually get to Antarctica as well, William Moore's the person who hangs around the camp, running all the experiments, and the person that the players will end up reporting back to most often. Whereas James Starkweather's doing things like going climbing mountains, um, other things which have never been done on Antarctica before, he's the one trying to do them all. So we're going through the background information where they're digging up information on the previous expedition cars, finding out what's happened. There's arriving in New York. The original sections are set in New York, but there's a lot of running around, finding out information, while the same people who wrote at the Mountains of Madness are trying to stop the expedition. Uh, there's various things happening. There's various other expeditions as well. There's a rival American expedition and there's a German expedition. Given this is the 1930s and the lead up to World War II, that becomes fairly relevant when there are problems on the ice and you have to call for help. 
are you going to be calling for Nazis? There's an investigation, the murder of the captain of the ship before you even leave. Um, and of course another captain gets hired, that's only a temporary thing, but you've got the investigation. There's kidnappings, there's sabotage, fires. They get to get in some action in defending against the ship being destroyed by fire before it even leaves. They're given advice by people who know about mythos. They're called and warned off. Then it details the ship. Because a large portion of this adventure is on the ship, we detail all the layout, the cabins, the routine, the daily routine, where all the cargo is. As I said, this book really goes into details you know, how they store the planes on board, as well as all the cargo. A lovely photograph. I don't know if that is actually the SS Gabriel. If that was a real ship, or that's just a stock photo of a ship of the time. Um, then we've got this at sea portion, which includes various ordinary things which happen. Because they're crossing the international date line, um... There's a certain ceremony which takes part on ships. I was told about this by my, by my father, who was a sailor. Um, he served in the Royal Navy and travelled around the world several times and told us about this, where they basically get hazed the first time you cross the International Date Line. Um, the ship arrives at uh, Melbourne, and you have to restock the ship for some of the sabotage works that's gone on, some of the stuff that was lost in the fire, and other things which have been happening during the journey. And then we finally arrive at the ice. You know, we're 100 pages into the book and we're only arriving at Antarctica now. You have to unload the ship. There's an older ship which is discovered. Embedded in the ice, one lost. There's the finding or setting up your original camp. The Lexington Expedition, the rival expedition, which, because there's a lot of interactions between the different camps, it gives you the layout and tells you what's happening there, in case the players are travelling between the camps asking for help. Then we've got the journey onto the mountains. The old, the Lexington and Starkweather camps, and then the camp from the original story. It's a layout and what it looks like now. Um, various things which are discovered. And then the Lexington expedition calls for help from the Germans. Because they've been having sabotage going on as well. So the balance of power at the camp changes from where your expedition or the player's expedition had the most power because it was a larger one. The other expedition now is two. So things change. As I said, the artwork's very evocative. You know, they're discovering the various horrors that happened during At the Mountains of Madness. And um, it's got layout of all the cargo that's carried along, so what supplies you've got. Up into the mountains themselves, laying it out. The discoveries which are made there. I'm flicking through, but you can probably read some of the titles yourself of what is discovered there. But beyond discovering what was discovered in the original novel or original story, it takes you beyond that. So there's various point, places which are visited by the characters in Lovecraft's story, but lots more as well. It fleshes them on and gives a reason for what happens in the original story and what happened to this area in prehistory. The horrors that existed there before. Um, my players actually had a lot of fun with this part. It wasn't as horrific as um, the adventure believed. Uh, apparently my players are more willing to 
lay down other characters' lives. Uh, the expeditions get together and start to deal with the problems. There's a chase as supplies get stolen and they need to recover them to get everybody back from the mountains themselves. You know, visiting various supply depots while others survive within the mountains. And then we've got the journey back where bringing back things of Cthulhu Mythos on board a ship turns out not to be the best idea and to a degree plays out much like Alien. Um, there's a Mythos thing aboard the ship and it's causing chaos. And then at page 289 we're going on to the appendices. So we've got public timelines for what's going on, the campaign timeline, fixed events which are happening. We've got lots of detail, the Antarctica manual here, so clothing, oxygen equipment, dog sled travel, tents and shelters, everything you need for detailed knowledge about life on the ice of Antarctica in the 1930s. Uh, you know, what happens with sunburn, snow blindness, hypothermia, altitude sickness, hypoxia, frostbite, the different types of weather which are likely to come even during the summer, flora and fauna, climbing the mountains. Um, the details of what you discover at the mountains themselves. You know, going through the expedition goals and summaries, there's just so much information in here really helps you out because your players will ask questions and a memory of reading through all this comes back to you. Um, there's various references back to At the Mountains of Madness and another story which it hooks into it. And then we're getting on to stuff like the handouts, so the equipment manifest as if it had been typed out. Uh, fuel usage for the various planes. Uh, the expedition personnel roster, the fate of what happens to them. The full bios of the characters, so we've got James Starkweather here, his stats and attributes, and then a full detailed background, his personality to help you role play him. We've got William Moore, it's all detailed out with him as well. And every single character from both of the main expeditions and some of the Germans as well. Photographs of them all. And um, here we are with the crew of the ship which take you there and bring you back. The feud between the expeditions, the Lexington expedition, the Barsmeyer Falcon, so the German expedition, where we've got all these characters laid out. The various vehicles, so we've got the stats and dimensions of the ships, of the aircraft, all the different ones used by the different expeditions, autogyros, right up to the Zeppelin, which the Germans bring in to evacuate themselves from the ice. Newspaper clippings and clues, notes and messages to people, letters, all the standard handouts. We've got a special character sheet for the 1930s because there are a few extra skills and things used for Antarctic survival. So you're probably best to use this character sheet rather than standard ones. The new and augmented skills which are on those character sheets. And various deck plans of the ship. Uh, the Antarctic clothing and layers and handouts for the players with all the maps. Just so much extra information. We've gone through almost as many handouts here as we did go through Adventure. There's just so much to give your players so they've got stuff to dig through and understand what's going on, clues contained within it. Then at the very back of the book we've got an advert for the Wizard's Attic and various Cursium things and a very nice black and white printed um, map of Antarctica with all the sites marked on it. Very, very useful stuff. So that was Beyond the Mountains of Madness for Call of Cthulhu. And that won the poll this week, or at least tied the poll this week, with 30% of the vote. 
with Beyond the Unknown for Dungeons & Dragons, getting the other 30%. But behind them came DNA DOA for Shadowrun on 19%, Unbound for Mech Warrior on 17%, and Nightwalker the Villy Affair for Millennium's End on only 3%, which is a sad thing, because Millennium's End Adventures and Sourcebooks were amongst the best presented. They were absolutely stocked full of ideas. Anyway, put up another poll for this week, and we're going back to retro RPGs. But we've reached the bottom shelf of this bookcase here, which is all my Star Wars stuff. So this week we've got Galaxy Guide 11, Criminal Organizations. We've got Gundark's Fantastic Technology, Personal Gear. Platt Smuggler's Guide. Han Solo and the Corporate Sector Sourcebook, which is one of the last hardback books I've still got left to cover. And Starships of the Galaxy, but that's for the Wizards of the Coast version of the role-playing game, rather than the West End Games version, which all the other source books cover. So it's from later, all the others are from the 90s, it's from 2001. But we'll see which one wins. On other channel-related stuff, well, I'll go into more details on the Friday video where I cover On Search of the Unknown, but there's not really much going on. As I've mentioned in previous videos, my life's gone to absolute chaos, but it looks like that is coming to an end within a week or so, so I'll try and get things back on track. I'll try and get the Discord sorted out. I'll try and get all the other things that I want to get done dealt with, and I'll let you know when I get those done. Anyway, I think I've witted on for quite long enough, so thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.